You know, all our lives have been put into some form of transformation during this pandemic. Daily work routines no longer include a commute, but do involve keeping the kids out of the range of the webcam. If you're in a business where you deal with people all the time, I mean face-to-face -face contact to help build up relationships, the two martini lunch, right, the business convention, or the movie screening for friends and customers, you had to pivot to a new path. But what about the damage to the soul? Right? Well, what have you been using as a relief valve to make up for that company picnic or business trip to Vegas where you get the human contact that goes along with the work? Linda Nelson has been an investment banker, IT executive, and real estate developer before pivoting into her true passion as a producer and distributor of films and television shows. In 2007, she co-founded Indie Rights with Michael Madison and has been active in creating and distributing quality content ever since. Hi, Linda. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are things going for you? Um considering everything that's going on in the world, they're going pretty good. Tell me a little bit about your business and what you do. My partner, Michael Madison, and I own a small movie studio. I call it a studio because we do both produce our own films, plus we distribute our own films and about a thousand other films that belong to other people. And um, when I say distribute, I mean we supply content to all major outlets. Okay. Uh, streaming channels or broadcast. Uh, we do some limited theatrical, although right now there are no theaters open in California, so we're not doing any of that. Yep, that's true. Do you, um, you're not limited just to a California market, I assume, though, right? There are. Oh, no, we are, we are global, 120 countries. Cool. Any, any business at all? I know some theaters have opened around the country. Um, no theatrical business, but the streaming business is booming, of course, because most people are stuck at home and there's no sports, there's no movies, uh, there's no theater, uh, there's, for the most part, not regular dining in restaurants unless they ha happen to be fortunate enough to have a patio. Yep. Uh, so there's not a lot for people to do. And uh, so watching movies has become extremely popular. Uh, how did you get started being in the movie business? Well, that uh, was kind of a late starting career for me. I originally uh, started out in banking and investment banking. I lived overseas for quite a long time. I lived in the Middle East, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It was such a, a different experience than America. And then I lived in London for three years. And then I came back to the United States because I had a daughter who was born in London. And I did want her to be educated in the United States and have uh, a little more normal life than what I was leading when I was in the banking field. So I settled into the United States and I then started a new career in computers. I really enjoyed that. And I've always had a lot of fascination for technology. What exactly did you do with uh, computers back then? I actually operated the very first personal computer uh, network department in the country. And we wound up having about 250 uh, different branch offices that all connected to a big mainframe that was here in Los Angeles. Okay. And that was done with extremely slow modems. Yeah, I, re I remember the days. <laughs> right. But however, spreadsheets are not very big files. Uh, so... It, we, p p people were able to download data. Uh, it was in the insurance industry, and the insurance business is one of the most data-heavy businesses there is because insurance companies have to keep data forever. Right. Uh, so uh, data uh, from banking and, and insurance are, are two extremely data-heavy industries. When that company went under, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, another entrepreneurial-minded gentleman in, in uh, Orange County who was a big real estate developer. And okay. 
real estate was always something I had an interest in as well. Uh, you know, I've always loved uh, architecture. And so uh, this particular developer was interested in branching out into commercial real estate development of a very special type. And that was uh, something that was new at the time. And it was called, they were called urban entertainment centers. Okay. And all of those urban entertainment centers all had uh, major tenants that would be like an anchor tenant. And our concept was to build a large format theater, like an IMAX theater as the anchor tenant around these urban entertainment complexes. So we uh, proceeded to put into place about 12 projects, most of which were in the United States, but some were also in Europe. And okay. as uh, we were getting ready to roll out some of these theaters, we figured, well, we, we need to have some very, very special movie to open those theaters with, right? And at the time, all of the IMAX theaters were only in science museums. They didn't exist in the commercial realm like they do now. Now every multiplex has an IMAX theater, right? Yep, sure does. The whole concept was to start to make more commercial films. We, my partner and I uh, met at that time on the very first film project that I was involved with, and that was a concert film uh, to be the grand film to open these theaters with. And at the time, um, a band by the name of In Sync, this was in 2000, was the hugest band on the planet. So we were able to do a deal with In Sync to go on the road with them and film them while they were doing this uh, concert tour. So you actually you actually shot the the tour for them. You shot the performance. Yes, we did. We shot performance at four different locations, and then uh, came back and edited the movie. Nice. It was at that time that I just fell in love with that whole realm of movies and movie making. That experience was amazing because we were lucky enough to have an investor for that film that put up all of the money. It was a $5 million budget. And that movie is gorgeous. As you know, I don't have to tell you, NSYNC uh, kind of like fell through the floor not too long after that because the record company really felt strongly that Justin Timberlake uh, should have a solo career. Right. So the band broke up and they went on, and Justin Timberlake went on to have this incredible solo career. But in making that movie and premiering it, uh, all over the world, it was in it was in Japan, it was in London, it was in Germany. We got to travel and yeah. learn about distribution, and that was our first introduction to the movie business and you know and film distribution. And we absolutely fell in love with it. Now, on that particular project, we had a lot of money, we had a big budget, so we went out and hired the very best people we could hire. Uh, we hired uh, John Bailey was very, very famous director, you know, to be the DP, and he shot it. And then I had um, uh, my friend Christian Wagner, who did, has done all the Fast and Furious movies and very, very uh, well-known Hollywood editor. And so we were able to make these uh, really good connections, come out with a beautiful film, but we didn't feel like we had our hands on at all. We decided that we were going to become more hands on on the next project. Well, just about at that time, we were started. There was starting to be uh, an economic uh, recession, and there wasn't much film money floating about, and we were not able to raise money for another film. So we decided that we would buy a camera and write a film and shoot our own film. So we okay. made we made our first independent film. Uh, called Shifted. And we went on the festival circuit. We were in a couple of film festivals with that film. And when we started looking for distribution, we couldn't find any distribution companies that we felt were uh, fair or that were willing to be equitable in their contract arrangements with us. And at that time, we just decided, you know what, why can't we start our own distribution company? So you know, and it was really pr probably out of ignorance. If we had any idea what we were getting ourselves into, we probably would have been overwhelmed and not done it, you know. But uh -huh. as yeah. they say, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> so we gathered up about, I think, somewhere between eight and ten films 
uh, from other filmmakers that were in festivals with us. So there was a film festival called Dances with Films uh, in Los Angeles that has now become a, quite a big festival. Uh, and uh, we gathered up a bunch of filmmakers and we said, you know, do you want to come in with us and do this? And of course they did because they all wanted to get their films distributed. And so we started, we started our distribution company. And that was the first step in starting Indie Rights, which is a studio that we now have. And so okay. at that time, still the internet wasn't fast enough for streaming. Right. But the new innovative thing that was happening, people would be able to go online and pick a DVD and download it to their computer and then watch it whatever they wanted. Right. So they didn't have to go to the video store anymore. And this was mm -hmm. a brand new concept. When we started, it was a download to own type of business. And yes, it was okay. internet based, but you weren't actually watching it over the internet like we do today. Right. Well, the studios were all very, very stubborn. They thought, oh, this is never going to catch on. People are always going to, well, you know, first we had DVDs and now we have these beautiful Blu-rays, Blu-rays. None of the major studios got in the game. And here we are, we're building this library, all we're collecting films from everybody that we can get films from and our library is growing. And we actually had the first independent film that you could download from Amazon. And that oh, okay. product, that product back then was called Unbox. So it was a, a kind of a cool name for their first product. And that was their first internet-based movie product. Okay. Because we were willing to get involved with these Silicon Valley guys early on, we beta tested for, for many of them. And we have remained partners with all of them since those days. We beta tested for Google. We beta tested for what is now Tubi. And yeah. so we remain uh, in very strong relationships with all of these companies. And uh, that has been hugely beneficial for us because whenever they have some new feature or product that they want to try, they come to us because they know we're open to being, you know, innovative. For example, um, Amazon recently established Prime. Uh, their subscription channel was a big deal for the last three years. Well, their newest product relating to movies is called IMDb TV. And IMDb TV is a movie channel uh, that has ads on it. And it looks surprisingly like old-fashioned TV. So what's happened is that the television business has morphed into this streaming Avod business and everybody is getting in the game. There's Crackle, stuff, there's Google, Plus, there's, right. right? Yeah, yep. And, yep. It's, and it's just a better version of old-fashioned television because you don't have to be home Tuesday night at 9 o'clock to watch CSI or whatever. Right, so right. You can watch only... whatever you want, whenever you want to watch it. Yep. The only thing I'm wondering about it is at some point in the future, People are going to want to aggregate all of this different content together again with, you know, almost like a, a single bill instead of having 15 different bills per month to pay for all the different streaming <laughs> services, at which point we'll be back into the cable TV days, right. except it'll just be coming down off the Internet. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's interesting to see uh, where it's going. Uh, yeah. There is a huge blurring right now of the distinction between television and movies. Be yes, and, yeah, I agree. And COVID has only served to exaggerate that blurring because there's no movie theaters. So yeah. what's to distinguish between TV and movies? Really nothing because no movies are being put out in the theaters, right? Yeah, uh, COVID, mean, COVID accelerated the push to the you know premium video on demand, which was coming anyway. Uh -huh. Um I've, I've always believed that we were going to land in a place where if you wanted to go see a an event movie for the experience, like seeing it on a real IMAX screen, right? Or yeah. seeing uh, Star Wars in a Dolby theater with uh, with Dolby Atmos sound underneath you to, to envelop you, you would pay extra and go see it in the movies. And then everybody else would, day and date, watch the release on their TV at home, right? Right. Right. And I think that's going to make a better experience across the board for a lot of folks because I know I don't enjoy going to the movies on a Saturday night and having somebody bring their two-year-old with them, uh, <laughs> which happens all the time, right? Yeah. Um, 
but it does it does change the picture for the the distributors out there. It's an it's an interesting time that we're going through. Very. So you know, I mean, and right now uh, we are seeing a huge increase in our uh, business because people are stuck at home, nothing else to do, and uh, you know, and and I don't know how much that is going to change. Because what's happened is millions of people that weren't really bothering with streaming yet, they still were getting DVDs at Redbox and, you know, know, they've all signed up for streaming now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see people like uh, Hulu with 100 million subscribers, right? Yeah. uh, Yeah. and, And huge, huge increases in streaming because of COVID. Yep. So what's the most successful project you've done to date, individual uh, film or TV show? Um, our, the most successful one that we have right now is a bit of an oddball film for us. It's a comedy special, a stand-up comedy special of all things. And okay. it's called DeMarcus Cousins Presents Boogie's Comedy Jam. And it is a stand-up comedy show with a number of well-known comedians and it has just taken off in a huge, huge way. One, I think, I think people need to be entertained and laugh right now, right? Uh, yes, and, <laughs> I know. I would agree with that. Right. And so, you know, and then also because DeMarcus Cousins is a big, huge NBA guy, he went on ESPN and he mentioned the movie. And oh, more helped. independent films, that can just really, really uh, help. Absolutely. So that's, it? that's made it our most, you know, probably our, one of our most, one of our most financially successful. Awesome. Where's it, where's it distributed? Oh, it's on Amazon and Google okay. Play. And, so it's uh, on all no, of them. It's going to be everywhere. It's done so okay. well on Amazon as a paid transactional that we have not put it on subscription or ad supported channels yet, but that's where it's headed. It will be okay. everywhere eventually. Right now you have to pay for it on Amazon. So okay, cool. but, uh, within, I would say within three or four months, it, it will be on all of the major streaming platforms, which is normally what we do because most, most independent films don't have big stars in them. Right. So a lot of times people aren't willing to pay for them. They want to wait till they're either on a subscription channel, you know, a channel that they subscribe to like Prime or, yeah. you know, or they're on Tubi with ads. And so they, so, so people will wait. And normally we don't wait too long before we put them there. We, we usually, we like to give films a chance on pay transactional, but if nobody's buying, then we turn on subscription and ad support. Yeah. And then it yep. then can take off. And we've had, we have, a, we actually have a quite a large urban catalog okay a lot of filmmakers from detroit and atlanta and uh their films are doing extremely well because that's a market that's very underserved and we discovered that about three or four years ago and the word got out that you know we were a good home for urban films and so we have a very large catalog of urban films how did the world change for you when covid came down well i i think when we when we when we first heard that everything had to close, yeah, well, we happened to be in the most fortunate of situations because we are in a live work loft in downtown Los Angeles. Okay, we have always operated indie rights in a live work uh, environment. Okay, and 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 part of that is because what we do goes on twenty four seven. Right. In the not too distant past, we would be uploading every film, you know, to the Internet uh, and we would have four or five machines going at once and films uploading constantly to the Internet. <clears throat> We've greatly modified that that business in that uh, now when a new film comes in, as soon as it's QC and we know it's in, ready to be distributed, we push it out uh, to the cloud uh on Amazon Web Services, and it okay. resides there. And then that is hugely allowing us to scale our business because sure. now we can just, with the push of a button, push that film from the cloud to, to another to another cloud uh, right. for our channel. So, for for example, if, if BET wants it, we can just, with the push of a button, send it to BET. We no longer have to upload that from our office. Right. So it allowed us to do a lot more business. So we have started acquiring at a much faster rate. Okay. Uh, because we can also distribute at a much faster rate. 
COVID didn't really change our business very much in that sense. Uh, we're a very small, lean operation. We yeah. only have, there's only four of us. Uh, we have uh, two employees besides my uh, business partner, Michael, and myself. And they both live very close to the office. They are both extremely conscious of the fact that we are living in a COVID world. They are extremely careful. Uh, they don't go out and socialize uh, with other people. Uh, one one of the employees happens to be my grandson, Drew. And, uh, you know, so that's been fantastic uh, to have him here. And uh, we were at first thinking, you know, like, is it okay for, for them to come back and forth? And we were, we started. We started looking at, you know, how are we going to protect uh, all of us, each other, and from each other and, and for each other. So we made sure that we ordered a huge supply of PPE. So we, uh, we ordered a huge boxes and boxes of masks and rubber gloves. And um, we have a thermometer so we can check temperatures. Okay. And we have not been uh, letting people come to our office. That's That's been hard. Uh, yeah. We used, we used to quite uh, frequently have filmmakers come by so that you can build a personal relationship, uh, you know, with the filmmakers. Because when we, when we take somebody into Indie Rights, it's like a family in the sense that we hope that they will continue to bring us every film that they produce in the future. So we have some people that have five films with us eight films with us you know so it, it we don't ever you know like try to make a relationship with a filmmaker just to get one film right, uh, right. and it, and it benefits them to have their whole body of work within one uh, company yeah. Yeah. and and so uh that's been very hard and we we used to have we used to have people over quite frequently and we would have we've had barbecues and and we can't do any of that anymore right uh, where where we're located has really great amenities. There's a movie theater. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of you know great meeting uh, places and spaces. And yeah. we just it's all closed, so yeah. none of those facilities are even available. Yeah, and um, you know, so we we I, we miss that. Uh, we miss having that ability to have face to face. Uh, you know, relationships with, with our filmmakers. And I look forward to that happening again. Sure. You know, do, do you do, all, do you do a lot of, um, I mean, it's never the same, right. But do you do a lot of video conferencing and that kind yeah. of stuff now? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's been especially uh, difficult when it comes to film markets. Um, yeah. our, you know, I mean, our, we really have a B2B business, you know, filmmakers are, you know, their relationship with us is a B2B relationship. So, you know, we have a contract with them and they give us their content to, to we license it for a certain period of time. And then we then go and, and distribute that on all the various channels. So then we're sub licensing it to like Amazon and Google and Apple and, and right. all of these other uh, channels. And so th those are B2B relationships between the channels and us. And then um, the other big part of our business is the global business where we go to film markets and we have, they're like giant trade shows, right? Yeah. Yep. And, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the American film market, but it's an experience. And that is the business of film. Yeah. And that's the true B2B aspect of, of film. And that's where, uh, like, for example, at the American film market, it's at, held at Lowe's Hotel down on the beach in Santa Monica every year, every November. Yep, yep. And they take all the beds out of the hotel rooms and they put tables in there and you have... You have a hotel room and that becomes your office for the market. So all right. of the all of the all of the companies that have content to license sit in those offices and then the buyers go from room to room to room to room yeah. and they come to see what you have and then they'll sit down and do a deal memo with you and maybe license some of your films. And also some uh, filmmakers come uh, to license films to you as well. But primarily, right. you're there to license the content that's in your library. So uh, we go to two of those big markets every year. One is the American film market that's here in L.A. And then the other one is the Cannes film market, which is in France, in south of France. Nice. And nice. so every year, we always look forward to going to France for that because 
we take a week after the market's over and that's our one vacation that we sure. take every year. So, you know, so sure. we absolutely adore going to France every, um, every May. And this year they were not able to have it. It was right after the pandemic really shut everything down. And so that yeah. was virtual market and now the American film market, which is coming up in a couple of weeks is also going to be virtual and and they ha I have to say they've done a really amazing job of doing it virtually. So we have a virtual booth and it's basically a Zoom room, right? Okay. And we yeah. set up appointments just like with buyers, just like we would if it was in person. And right. you know, they come at a specified time and you you fill up your meeting schedule and and we also have screenings. And uh, Can did a great job uh, with their with the virtual screenings of films. So, like we screen nine films at the Can virtual market, and the way that would happen is like it was at three o'clock in the afternoon here, and then it, when it was three o'clock in the afternoon in Hawaii, it was there. And then when it was three o'clock in the afternoon in Tokyo, it was there. So okay. it just went around the globe, and, yeah. and and that was very convenient, you know, for people to be able to watch it. At all, everybody at the same time in their time zone. Do you do you think that when things open up again, that the these conferences will come back to their normal state, or do you think that this is going to be the future of how they're going to go? Well, I hope that we go back to having physical markets because, for the same reason that it's nice to have a, a physical relationship with yeah. people that you do business with and meet face to face and and yep. get to know people, it's not the same doing it in a virtual room. Absolutely. It, uh, you know, it just isn't the same, you know? So yep. I hope, uh, though I would not be surprised if in the future that they will become hybrid. I'm, I'm thinking that there, you will always have an option of being a virtual exhibitor or yeah. a live exhibitor and that people that can't travel because you're really yep. traveling all the way around the world. I mean, we go to France I mean, it's a long way away. Yeah. <laughs> Right. No, absolutely. And, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, so everybody can't afford to go. It's very expensive. It costs, you know, our company probably $25,000 go to each market by the time you have expensive plane tickets and you have to rent, you know, you have to have uh, accommodations while you're there. Yep. And it's, yeah. it's quite, and then the, the booths are expensive. Uh, yeah. So it's, 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 it's a lot of expense, uh, yeah. but I still, I hope, I hope that we will at least have a hybrid version of the markets in the future. Have the projects you're developing or any of the filmmakers, you know, that are out there gone back in and started working again yet? I know that the, the industry set out a whole bunch of standards for how to shoot safely and we've seen some production starting to light up what's your experience been with that um, so far we actually uh have seen that i think from when the time that the lockdowns first started all of the films that had finished shooting went into post-production and post-production you can do in a closed environment yeah right? yeah so everybody who might have taken you know, like a long, many, many, many months to, to, to edit their film that it, it condensed that editing time. And so we've seen a huge flow of, uh, films come into us. Okay. That we're finished. Okay. But that being said, we expect to see a real gap because of the time that no productions were happening. Yeah. So there was a time when there were no productions going on. Now, we are seeing a number of people doing projects that can be done in a COVID safe way. Um, we have a new film coming out. Um, it's supposed to open in Los Angeles for uh, okay. uh, theatrical, but I don't think the theater is going to be open. It is yeah. booked and due to come out. And as I'm doubtful now that it's going to happen. So uh, we probably will just turn around and, and put it out straight to uh, uh, broadcast and VOD. The uh, our director, the the director of the film is currently in Texas shooting another film for someone else, and uh, they have a COVID monitor on yeah. set. Everyone is uh, isolated in the sense that they are all housed and kept separate from everyone else, and they get their temperature taken, and you know uh, are proceeding extremely carefully. So, so production is starting to gear up. I think 
there are certain types of films that would be very difficult to shoot right now. Um, yeah. But there are other types of films that are a little better suited uh, for this type of. Um, well, it's good. It's good. It's good at least to know that folks are starting to get back to work because mm-hmm. it was been it's been a pretty dismal year for all of us Absolutely. out here. Uh, so and and knowing that gap is coming somewhere down the road, yep. you know, there's something to look forward to on the other side of it. Right. How, how how's your family holding up through all of this? Um, I, you know what? It's uh, there's been quite a bit of strain, you know, for a for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of, you know, one of our employees, you know, I mentioned that uh, Drew does uh, work here and yeah. uh, his, uh, uh, his parents were extremely nervous about him coming to work. And, and I think most of that was because they really didn't understand how safe our environment was. So uh, that caused a lot of stress, you know, for, uh, from a personal point of view. I mean, it's only because it is my grandson that it was such a difficult situation. If it was just a, re- a another employee, like we have another employee, well, I don't have yeah. to deal with his parents, right? That's that's <laughs> so, true. Right? That's true. So you know, and for Drew, it was difficult because he's stuck in the middle. Yeah. And so, so that that you know was extremely uh, tense. The pro- the biggest problem was that there it really what he does uh, really can't be done uh, outside, remotely. yeah, uh, and it, remotely because he one he does not have the internet capability that we have here, right? Right. We have a thousand megabytes per second upload, right? Yeah. And that's not something that most people have at at home, right? And, and right. Uh, so and also <clears throat> the source of the work comes to us on a hard disk in the mail. Right. So right. it's a physical drive. It has to be put into an editing system and the QC has to be done and then it yep. has to be delivered to the cloud. So yep. that's something that really needs to happen here uh, yeah. in the office. Yeah. So so that was difficult. And then but I think also I think there right now everybody's kind of stressed and on edge about a lot of things. It's not yeah. just COVID, but we have like this perfect storm. Uh, of issues going on with the with the election and yeah. you know I mean I see on both um, both sides my side of the family and also on my partner's side of the family different political views yeah and and you know I think because part of it is that pe- people are watching too much news <laughs> and, yeah and, you're, and, you're absolutely and, right and, and different news and different people watch different things and so you know like a pair uh my partner's from texas and his parents are pretty typical you know republican yeah. texas uh yeah. conservative i would say we're moderate lefts right yeah we're, we're yeah conservative people i mean you know we're i see myself as a conservative liberal <laughs> yeah i, I right. i'm with you i'm i'm I find myself being right down the middle and dreaming of having Eisenhower running for president, right, you know? Right. And so then on my side of the family, uh, I have a sister who lives in upstate New York and, and she is 180 degrees polar opposite of me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And she yeah. believes everything that comes out of our president's mouth and um, just for the longest time, thought that the virus was a hoax. Uh, she's oh. finally co- reconciled to the fact that, you know, that is it's, not the case. You know, it's one of those things. I've spoken to many different people from different parts of, some from other parts of the world, uh, others from different parts of the country. And the underlying thing I keep getting is, if you live outside of a city and haven't experienced people getting sick, you don't believe it. Some of our family members, like Michael's sister, has to homeschool her children, right? Yeah. And she yeah. got uh, furloughed from her job. And, yeah. you know, so, I mean, there's all of these, you know, issues going on with everybody. So everyone is, you know, concerned yeah. for multiple things. I mean, normally there might be one crazy thing happening on, you know, at a time. Yes. You know, yeah, but, but right now but, there's economic problems with so many people out of work. Uh, you know, there's, you know, your kids' education and worrying about your children. Yep. And then you're yep. worrying about who's going to be president or not, or whether we're going to have chaos and riots in the street. Yeah. No matter who wins. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean. So, 
so are you but are you optimistic about the next six months i mean what do you think what do you um i think this will be with us throughout the winter okay i i really do i i don't think that um it looks like the vaccine you know it's not i don't believe it's going to be ready till january or february and then i think it's going to be another i don't know four to six months before it's widely available yeah, so I'm I'm, totally with you on that. I'm hoping that we get to go to France for Cannes in this in May. That's okay. my hope. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful of that, and and okay. I hope that once the election is over, people can <clears throat> be accepting of whoever wins. Yes, and I agree. And move on, and hope that you know the government can start functioning again. And I, uh, you know, so so I, I I'm. I'm looking forward to the election uh, be a release valve, so to speak, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. a certain amount of pressure that everyone's feeling. It's it's funny because it's kind of a dismal time, but there's so much possibility yes. in the future yeah. for it to get better. Uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> Linda, what can I plug for you? What can we tell the audience to go we look at? We would love for people to uh, start to see indie rights as a great catalog of entertainment that if they're looking for a good movie that they don't have to look any further than indie rights. And one of the ways you can do that, if if you're an Amazon user, if you go on Amazon and you put indie rights in the search box, all of our movies will come up and you'll be able to see them. Also, you can, uh, you know, if you want to know more about our company, you can go to our website, which is IndieRights.com. And uh, you can find just about any type of movie you want. If you're interested in food, we have this great documentary called Fat Fiction, which is about um, trying to unravel the truth about fat and carbs. Okay. Uh, if, if you are curious about how Netflix got started. We have a wonderful documentary called Netflix versus the world. And it really talks about the birth and it's like the origin story of Netflix. Absolutely fascinating documentary. If you like horror films, we've got tons of great horror films. We've got great dramas. And uh, so just about any kind of movie you would like, uh, you'll find in the Indie Rights catalog. Awesome. Oh, I know what I will tell you about. Our new movie is called Blood from Stone. So uh, it's a very contemporary vampire film. The vamp- the lead vampire in it, the male lead vampire in it, looks like Jason Momoa, set in Las Vegas. Very, very fast acting. And, and I think uh, that people will really enjoy it. Awesome. We will definitely look for it. Thanks for taking some time out today to talk with me. This was great. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks.